I'm Pastor Joe. It's good to be here on this Easter Sunday with you, church. A, uh, I want to just tell you about my week briefly. Oh, this is probably, I probably shouldn't get rid of this, huh? That's important. Don't get rid of that. Just set that down for a minute, he said. Uh, Holy Week is um, taxing on clergy. Just being candid. Starts with Passion or Palm Sunday, uh, last Sunday, seven days ago. For some of you, that's the last time we saw each other. For others, I saw you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. I don't think I saw any of you yesterday. If I did, forgive me for not remembering that. But on Thursday morning at 6 a.m., 11 men gathered for prayer at Park Church, like they do every single week. And at 7.02 a.m., one of those men said, Pastor, we need to pray over you for the rest of the week because you look tired. I was like, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. Of course I'm a little tired. (laughs) And those men invoked the spirit of the living God upon my physical body. And I am not the least bit tired this morning. And this is round three. The power of prayer. Some of you have never prayed before. You don't have to get it right. I hope that you hear that by the end of the message today. There's no set order of words or do this in this order or pay this much. It's all about Jesus, actually. I want to pray for you. More importantly, I want to pray for me right now. And I would welcome your prayers, too. I've already prayed for you this morning. Holy God, thank you for the gift of time that we have right now. And Lord, for the strength that you have given me in my physical body. Lord, I ask that if it be your will that you would use me for your glory today to advance your kingdom, Jesus. That your Holy Spirit would flow freely through me And that others today in communion might experience your presence. Father, it's good to be gathering today on your holy day. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. I want to just make an intentional welcome to those that are worshiping online with us this morning also. Uh, Make sure you share in the chat if you're on with us. We can't see you, but you can see us. It'd be kind of weird if we could see you, I guess, but uh, it's good to be gathering today on Easter together, isn't it? Yeah, amen. You can, you can clap. I heard somebody, there was a clapper. There was a rogue clapper. Yeah. Listen, applause and, and all of that is appropriate during worship as long as you're applauding the Lord. Please do not applaud me. Please do not applaud Brennan or our beautiful worship team. Give thanks to God the Father Almighty through his Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit who has brought us together today. Amen? Amen. So it's Easter Sunday. (laughs) Literally hundreds of millions of people are gathering all around the world. They gathered this morning before daylight. Think about that. Maybe that was some of you. I stepped outside on the patio at 4.45 a.m. this morning. The moon was bright, the stars were bright, and one bird began to sing. (laughs) 2,000 almost years ago, it was in the dimness of the morning that the early Christians began to gather. That's why we gather before daylight on Easter Sunday. We go expectantly to the space where Jesus was, knowing now that he is no longer there, for he is alive. It's at the break of dawn that a brand new day 
has begun. And it's at the break of dawn that everything changed. It's Easter. Let's just start at the beginning, shall we? For some of you, maybe this is your first time hearing the Easter story. Let the scriptures, by the power of God's spirit, speak to you today. In Matthew's gospel, it it records that early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to see the tomb. You should probably understand that this is the place where Jesus' body had been buried after he had been crucified by the Romans three days earlier. It says, suddenly there was an earthquake and an angel moved the giant stone away from the opening of the tomb. I've never been inside of a tomb. I don't know if you have. <laughs> Hopefully, see this is where every once in a while you get a little glimpse into Joe's mind, right? <laughs> anyway, it wasn't a tomb like maybe you've experienced in the past. It was literally a hole in the side of a mountain. It was dark, it was dirty. I know because I've been in caves before. It was damp. It says that the angel sat on that stone. The Bible says the angel's face shone like lightning and his clothes were brilliant white. The Bible says then that when the Roman guards saw this happen, because remember, they had put guards there to make sure nobody stole the body of Jesus. It says, when the Roman guards saw this happen, they shook with fear and fainted. (laughs) I would probably faint too. And my guess is you would also. The Bible then says, the angel spoke to the women who had gone up there to anoint his body. You see, Mary loved Jesus. The Bible says, the angel said to her, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he isn't here. He's been raised from the dead, just as he said would happen. So come and see for yourselves that there's nobody in the tomb. I think Mary that morning was scared because she went expectantly to find Jesus. She just wanted one more touch. I've been present with a lot of people when they've moved from the present life into the afterlife. I remember some of my family is here. We were all in the room together when my dad breathed his last. It was my oldest brother, Bob, who was standing at the head of the bed and uh, When the alarm alarmed us that it was time, Bob began to weep and laid himself on my dad for one more touch. Maybe you've been there. Mary just wanted one more touch. She loved him. The Bible then says that The angel said, go quickly and tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he's headed to Galilee and that he will see all of you there. So the women ran quickly from the tomb. And then the Bible says this, they were scared. It says they were also filled with great joy. 
It says, but they rushed to give the angel's message to the disciples. But this is where the story gets interesting in the Bible. It says, as they were going to the disciples, they ran into Jesus. I love Jesus' response in the Bible, which is exactly how he responded. It says, he says, greetings. Like nothing happened. <laughs> oh. I think if he was here, he'd say, good morning. Good morning. Then the women came close to him and they touched his body. Mary just wanted that touch. I think in that moment they also realized that this really is Jesus. It says that when they touched him, they worshipped him. Friends, that's actually the only response we will have when we touch Jesus, is worship, adoration, a sudden realization that things exa are exactly as they appear. We will be awestruck. It says Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. I just kind of love that too, right? Has anybody ever been scared before? Is it helpful when you say, don't be afraid? <laughs> oh, Jesus, I love that man. He said, go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they'll see me there. For those of you that might not know the rest of the story, I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis of what takes place over the next 40 days. But the Bible records that Jesus didn't just kind of poof and leave. It says that he was ministering to people, that he was witnessing to people, that people touched him, people engaged with him, they engaged in conversation with him, he talked to them. It says at one time he witnessed to more than 500 people at once. The Bible says that he cooked dinner and ate fish, and I don't know if they had chips, but they had fish and bread, the Bible says. It was really him. You know, that same community, just put yourself there just for a moment. You're in Jerusalem in the first century. The Romans have just executed Jesus and two other thugs. Two other criminals. They had executed them. That means they crucified them until they died. And lots of people saw it. The Bible says that one of the soldiers at the end, after Jesus had breathed his last, took his spear, thrust it into his side, and witnessed the blood and the water coming out. And in that moment, the Bible says that the centurion understood, truly this man was the Son of God. Imagine that centurion a week later when Jesus is walking around Jerusalem. No wonder so many came to Christ in that moment. Think about this with me just for a minute. This was the single most important moment in all of time. Everything before it is dated B.C. Everything after it is dated A.D. Even in our post-Christendom world, we date ourselves from that moment in time. It's almost as if life began then. On this weekend, over two billion people will be gathering to celebrate Jesus. Praise God. I want to share with you three key things about who God is this morning. And I want to look at three passages in Scripture to see it before we 
began, I went back to Casey and Tammy and said, scratch all of the notes that I had. Because <laughs> last night, God and I rewrote the message. There's three words I want you to grab a hold of today. The first, well, phrases, I guess, is a better way to put it. The first is that God is merciful. And that you, whether you acknowledge it or not, have received mercy. The second is that God is graceful or full of grace. And that you, whether you have received it or recognized it, have been recipients of God's grace. And the third is that God loves you. God loves you. The person who this morning got out of bed, got dressed, and came to church. Even if you hadn't come to church today, God still loves you. I want to start with the Gospel of John. And uh, if you're not familiar with the Bible, it's broken into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Gospels are the beginning of the New Testament. And uh, each book is its own story, all part of a bigger narrative of what God is doing from the beginning of time when he created this world till he comes again. And the Gospel of John is the fourth book of the New Testament. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And in John's Gospel, we're going to look at the eighth chapter. If you're new to reading scripture, or maybe you've never read the Bible before, maybe your experience with the Bible has only been in church or in, you know, mom yelling it to you at times, or grandma telling it to you, or grandpa telling it to you, or dad, I want to encourage you to start with reading the Gospel of John today. After the service today, begin reading the Gospel of John. But in the eighth chapter of John, we're going to experience mercy with someone who experienced it firsthand. And the Bible says this, it says, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. The Bible says that he sat down to teach them. So it wasn't like it is today where teachers typically are standing in the front. The teachers typically would be seated in a position of authority. It says that Jesus sat down to teach them. It says the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group. The Bible says that they said this to Jesus. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, we are commanded as such to stone this woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. So that you understand a little bit better what was taking place, this woman was completely naked. They brought her out with shame, to shame her, to publicly disgrace her, and to publicly execute her right then and there. For some of us, shame has identified who we are. For others, maybe that language of caught resonates with you. Maybe at times in life you've been caught. The Pharisees, the Bible says, were trying to catch or they wanted to catch Jesus in a trap. They wanted him to make the wrong statement. This is her story. What's your story? What do you get caught up in today? What is it that trips you up over and over and over again? What do you get caught up in that keeps causing you to stumble? Maybe you're caught up in an unhealthy relationship. Maybe you've been caught up in a bad business deal. Maybe you've been caught up in a secret habit that nobody knows about and that you hope nobody ever finds out about. Maybe you've been caught up in addiction. Maybe you've been caught up in materialism, 
thinking that money is the whole purpose of life. Maybe you've been caught up in living your life trying to please other people. You're living for the approval of others and it's a huge trap, friends. It's a huge trap. A lot of people stumble trying to please others. They live their entire lives for the approval of another human being. And they never hear it. This woman is obviously caught up in a wrong relationship. Let's continue on, though. The story doesn't end there. It says, Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. There have been a lot of really smart people who have tried to tell us what Jesus was writing, but we really have no idea because the Bible doesn't tell us. It just says he bent down and wrote in the sand or the dirt. When they kept on questioning him, the Pharisees that is, it says he straightened up and he stood up. And he said to them, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. Again, he stooped down and began to write on the ground again. I don't think Jesus was just doodling in the sand. But we have no idea what he was writing. But what John records happens next was this. He says, those who heard began to go away one at a time. You can almost see it unfolding. The Bible says the older ones went first. I think that's because the older we are, the more we recognize our sin. It says they went away one at a time until only Jesus was left. It was just Jesus and this woman standing there. The Bible says that Jesus straightened up then. And he asked her, woman, where, where are they? He didn't really want to know where they were. Because his next statement was what he wanted her to hear. Has no one condemned you? And the woman said, no one, sir. And then Jesus says this, then neither do I. Go now and leave your life of sin. I love it. I think I love it because I've been there. And I've experienced his mercy because it's exactly what Jesus does. When I've come and I've messed up, he does exactly what he did with this woman that day. The Bible says very clearly that he didn't condemn her. Very clearly. The Bible also says he didn't condone her. He didn't say it's okay. It wasn't okay for her to cheat on her husband, in fact. What the Bible says is that Jesus didn't condone her, condemn her, and he didn't condone her. What the Bible says is that he changed her. And that, friends, is what Easter is all about. That which is broken being made whole. And that's exactly what Jesus does in your life when you accept his mercy. He doesn't condemn you. 
He also doesn't condone what you've done. Jesus changes you. And that, brothers and sisters, makes all the difference. So what exactly happens if I ask God for mercy? Maybe that's what you're asking yourself this morning. Maybe you're saying, i got to get me some of that. God's mercy forgives you, and God's mercy frees you. It frees you from all of those things that maybe you were answering questions to just a few moments ago. It frees you of the tyranny and the burden of the past through forgiveness. And it frees you to go and sin no more. So many people are stuck in their past. They can't possibly get into the future because they're stuck back here. And everything you want is up here. I wonder what holds you captive. What is it that that maybe is holding you hostage this morning that you need to be set free from? What's got you locked up inside? What What are you enslaved to? What are you in bondage to? What has imprisoned you? Some of you right now are burdened with regret. And that's not Pastor Joe talking to you. That's the Lord speaking to you this morning. Some of you are navigating regret and it's holding on to you because you can't possibly let go of the past. Some of you are navigating resentment and it's got you held hostage against your own will because you're navigating what other people have done to you and you resent them and you make statements like, I can't possibly forgive them. I'll never forgive them. And you're bitter. And you're imprisoned. Some of you are in prison to worry. Some of us worry to worry. (laughs) We can't possibly think of life without some kind of fear. The Bible tells us, friends, very clearly that that's not from the Lord. It says in Paul's letter to Timothy that He didn't come to give us a spirit of fear, but of power, which only comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of love, which only is witnessed in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and a sound mind, which only comes by the Spirit of God transforming us from who we were to who he would have us be. Some of you are bound by addictions and those secret sins. And the secret habits. If you come to God with your secrets and your habits and your hurts and your missteps, listen to me very carefully. He's not going to scold you. The woman caught in the act of adultery was a prime target for shame. It's not how he responded. He's going to save you, actually. And that's what Easter is all about. I know a lot of things, but one thing trumps everything God's mercy makes the impossible possible. And God's grace is the agent that moves you forward. The second thing I want to share with you on this beautiful Easter morning is that God is full of grace. Each week we gather for prayer and there's a woman who shares every week. She goes, she prays, I thank God for second chances. Second chances is all about grace. Grace is, I think it was Francis Chan described it, is God's crazy love. His unmerited favor. 
Remember those women that were at the tomb that we just read about? Remember what the angel told them to go and do? Go tell the disciples and Peter. I want to read for you the story that took place just a couple of days before that exchange. It says this in the Bible that Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I, Jesus said, have prayed for you, Peter. I have prayed that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, I love it. Jesus knew Peter was going to turn away before Peter turned away. And when you have turned back, Peter, go and strengthen your brothers. Peter replies, and I, oh, I just, Peter just resonates with my soul. Because I'm the guy that runs out before I know what, before I got a plan, I'm out there doing something. And Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus says to him, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows this morning twice, you'll deny me three times. Fast forward a few hours. Judas has just betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Peter has just cut the servant's ear off with his sword. And the guards have seized him and are taking him away. It says, then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. And Peter followed at a distance. It says, and when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. It was the middle of the night. It was dark. They didn't have lights. They didn't turn lights on, street lights. There's no, nothing like that. There's, it's dark. They're gathering around a little burn barrel. And they're warming themselves by it because... In Jerusalem, it's cold at night. In the desert, it's really cold at night. It says they were warming themselves by the fire. It says a servant girl saw, Jesus, saw Peter sitting there in the firelight. We had a little fire in our little thing on the patio last night. You can't really see real clearly under firelight, can you? But she recognized him. She said to everybody else that was there, this man was with that guy. And Peter says, woman, I don't know him. A little bit later, someone else saw him. And it, the wheels are turning. You, you can play this out in your mind. The wheels are turning with people. And another person says, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, says Peter. And I, and I can almost see him stepping away from the conversation, whatever it was. And about an hour later, another one asserted, certainly this fellow was with him. I recognize his accent. He's a Galilean. Like it was a dirty word. It was actually there at that time. And Peter says, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And listen to what the Bible says happens next. It says, the Lord turned and his eyes locked with Peter's. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said. And the Bible says that he left quickly and he was weeping. Peter, I think, was weeping because of disappointment. Not in Jesus, but in himself.
What's your secret disappointment? You have one. We all have one. Some of us have lots. If we could do an x-ray of your heart right now, what would it, what would it reveal as your deepest disappointment? Maybe if you were really honest with me, you'd say, Pastor Joe, I'm disappointed in my marriage. It's not what I signed up for. I don't have that spark that I felt that, that glorious day however many years ago. Maybe you'd say, if I'm really honest, Pastor Joe, I'm disappointed with myself. I thought I'd be at a different spot in my life than I am right now. I thought I'd be further along in the faith or further along in business or further along in relationships or further along in, you fill in the gap. Maybe you're disappointed in your children or your grandchildren. Maybe you're disappointed in your church. What does Jesus do with your disappointments? With your deep, deep secrets that nobody knows? I'll tell you exactly what he does. He responds with grace. The Bible says his eyes met Peter's. The engagement that the scriptures record that took place after the resurrection, Jesus didn't condemn Peter. Jesus didn't remind Peter, oh, hey, buddy, by the way, remember that time that you disowned me? The Bible says that he loved Peter. And the invitation to go back and tell Peter directly was a movement of God's grace. And it's right here where the full view, the crystal clear picture of Easter comes into play. I had the privilege of coaching young ladies in basketball. Being a coach is kind of a fun thing to do. Some people coach a little differently than I do. I, uh, I happen to be full of grace and encouragement. And I'm just out there screaming good job to these young ladies that are going to hear, you haven't done it right the rest of their lives. And I want them to hear for at least one season in their life, you are enough. Great job. And as your pastor, I just want to encourage you this morning. I want to be your coach this morning. Some of you, I know your stories. Others, I don't even know your names. Take a minute after the service and tell me your name, please. I'll try to remember it but I love you because God loves me and he's entrusted you to me. That's the last thing I want you to hear this morning is that God loves you and that Jesus went to the cross for you. That he's not interested in all of the shame and all of the guilt and all of the resentment and all of the disappointments He's just interested in you. I want to leave you with prayer this morning. And for some of you, maybe you've never prayed before. There were two guys. The Bible says that there was one on his right and there was one on his left. And it's crystal clear that they both deserved the punishment that they were receiving. One of those gentlemen prayed this. He simply said, remember me. Remember me. And Jesus said, okay. Today you will be with me in paradise. You don't have to get it all right. You don't have to say a secret prayer and a secret order. 
You just have to be present with God and acknowledge him. And in that moment, you receive his mercy, his grace, and his love. I'm going to pray for you. And I'd encourage you to pray with me. Holy God, thank you for your church. That's gathered here this morning. On this, your holiest of days, Lord. And Jesus, thank you for being mindful of us while we were yet sinners. And church, if you just need to cry out to Jesus today, just tell him to remember you. Father, restore us into right relationship with you because of Jesus today. Snatch us from the pit of hell and move us into the kingdom of light where yours is the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Friends, receive the mercy of God today. Receive the grace of God today. And know that you are loved by God today. May the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, be before you to lead you, beside you to justify you, behind you to defend you, above you to guide you. But might the Spirit of the living God through the cross, be within you, saving you, and enabling you to go. And love the hell out of your neighbors, friends. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends. Happy Easter.